working on recording all of these sessions now and now you have to do a little review of what you just talked about. <laughs> now Sarah tell me I have to go back through and review. Um, so uh, I'll just say for the, uh, um, the recording of this that we are starting on our second session and the, the date's the October 23rd of 2013. Um, and uh, Gary had to be out of town for this one. All right. So um, now let me come back. The, and, and when you use the word nerves, we use the term fasciculi. So we go from the three sensories that we're looking at, the visual, the auditory, and the somatosensory for vision and hearing and touch. And uh, we are not looking at taste or smell because people don't usually come to us for taste or smell. So those haven't been the ones that I'm uh, primarily interested in. Uh, and they go from the primary uh, organs, the sensory organs, I should say, and then through the fasciculi they go to the thalamus, and then the thalamus decides which part of the brain, uh, of the cortex, the outer part of the brain, which part of the cortex to send that message to, that information to, and then it gets to that primary um, processing center, and uh, then from there it goes to the association cortices and from there um, it, it turns into a perception. And that's where we left off last time and we are going to go from that point forward today. Uh, Miles, I can't see you anymore. Are you still around? Miles, did we lose you? If you're can, sit, speak louder, if if uh, I thought I heard something, huh? Okay. Uh, let me have one second to make Sarah aware in case she can work that out with Miles. Miles, is that you coming back? Hello? Oh, there you are. Okay. I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't find you. Okay. Um, and I can't see you. Did your camera shut off? No, it, it um, there was like a fluctuation in the, um, in the Wi-Fi. Okay. That's fine. Um, so... Um, did you hear the end of that where I said it goes from primary to association and we get a perception and then that's where we left off last time at uh, having the perception for auditory, uh, visual, and somatosensory? Yeah, I heard that. All right. Uh, any other questions? Um, no. Okay, we're good. And Elizabeth already said she was up on this, and McGill told me uh, that she was. So let us jump in here, and we're going to actually just take a quick trip through what we had. And uh, this, uh, Miles, I think will show it to you a little more. Now, uh, now somebody, um, I'm getting an echo. Somebody did something. Is that How's that? Okay, so Miles. Oh, no, no, no. The echo's still there. Are you trying something on your headset, Miles? Yeah. Okay, then now. Just turn. Yeah, it was all, it left then when you uh, quick clicked that. Okay. Okay, so yeah, good. Good job. Um, all right. Now, so here we are. And Elizabeth, you're still there, right? Um, there you she can, is. Can you, can you continue without me for like one or two minutes? I have to go give a camera to my classmate to film my lecture for me. Uh, sure. We'll okay, continue. So just pretend that. like I'm still here.
All right. Okay. So here we are. And here's our boy and girl looking at each other. And now, uh, I am looking now for both uh, you, Elizabeth, and um, you, Miguel, to uh, talk I'm, to me here. I'm here. Okay. And I'm hoping Elizabeth's there. And so now tell me, what do we have going on here? And I can't hear you, Elizabeth. I still can't hear you, Elizabeth. I see your mouth moving, but there's no words coming through. Now, your mouth is moving, Elizabeth, but I can't hear you. Do you have your speaker turned on? Elizabeth, is your is your speaker turned on? I mean, your uh, microphone. Yes, but it's not working. Okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, that just means you're going to have to write notes to me the whole time. I'm teasing with you. <laughs> Okay, it's okay. I've got it working. Do you know that's oh. how bad I am at technology? Okay, well, but you, you're there now. I see you getting that working perfectly. Match with Miles coming back. Okay. Um, now, Miles, you have to move your uh, microphone away from your nose just a little bit. We can uh, hear you breathing. There we go. So here's our first step, and what do we have here? Everybody. So the the person's seeing, and it's going to the thalamus. Okay, so we've got our primary sensory input, in this case the eyes, to the thalamus. And what's going to be our next step? And then it's going to go to the cortex. Well, the for, before we go to the cortex, something's going to happen. What is it? It's going to go to the occipital lobes. But before that, and let me shift here, the thalamus has to determine which cortex or which cortices the sensory input will be sent. Okay, you can see that that's there on the picture uh, that you all have. And then now you're all telling me it goes to the cortex and you are correct. And you can see the way we set this up that we've got our thalamus looks like two eggs in the center. And the green means it's a deeper structure and now it moves to the red, um, and the red means it's going to be at the cortex, and in this case, it's the occipital lobe, which McGill already said, and um, what placements? 01, 02, OZ. Okay, and I mentioned last time that OZ and FPZ are not part of the original 1020 system. We have included them. We call that our enhanced 1020 system. Um, and you can't do live Z-score training there because there's no live Z-scores for those placements. But since we have trained there so often, uh, we have added them. Okay, so now it's going to move to the occipital lobe at 01, OZ, and 02. And what is going to happen at the occipital lobe? It's going to <clears throat> the visual um, stimulus or whatever will be. It will be identified as like it will be matched up to what you already know what stuff is. Like that's a chair, or um, not yet. You're going too yet. far. It is the processing of the primary visual input. So it's not a perception yet. No, it is not a perception. It's not a comprehension. It just says something visual is coming in. Well, then the brain begins to ask questions about, well, what color is it, what shape is it, what, whatever. Correct. In order to move it to the next level. Uh, correct. All right. And now, what is the next level? Where are we going next? 
Association cortex. Association. Visual association. Very good. Yeah. Visual association cortex. And um, the for the visual system, there are two components of the visual association. And what are those two components? One word for each of them. The hypothalamus and the no, no, no. Now you're you're uh, ahead, way ahead of me, Elizabeth. Oh, the... I can see Miles. It's coming to his brain. The what and the where. Okay, so here we go. And here it's moving to the association cortex. Like spatial. Uh, the right Visual side, spatial. yes, that's true, but, but you're still ahead of me. Um, what we have is, and let me actually shift this. Do you see it here? The wear of vision. Like when we're looking at something, our brain figures out where what we're looking at is. And that takes place here between the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. You see it right on the picture. Okay. And then over on the left, we have the what of vision. And on the right, we have the what of vision. What is it we're looking at? So the one part says, where is the thing we're looking at? And the other part says, what is the thing we're looking at? And uh, tell me where the uh, the perception on the left side of the brain or the right side uh, from a neuroanatomical point of view. Where is this? See my pointer going up and down on it. Where is that neuroanatomically? T5, you mean, or oh, the, the hippocampus? No, the temporal lobes. No, yes, it's not. And the, and the globus. No, the you're, pallidus you're, the you're too far ahead of me on that, Miles. See, you guys have all this knowledge, and you're wanting to, to run ahead. Um, it is the temporal lobe, and what part of the temporal lobe in particular? What, the superior? Inferior. 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 Inferior, <laughs> yes. The inferior temporal lobe. Um, and let me uh, let me uh, jump to something here. Let me get you a better view of that one second. Let me go back to this one. And if you look here on the screen, uh, do you see this? Here's the temporal lobe right here. And here, this top portion, this is the superior temporal. Then here we have the middle temporal. And here we have the inferior temporal. So the visual association takes place in this inferior portion of the temporal lobe. All right? Everybody's good with that? OK. And let's move mm -hmm. back. Now we do our primary processing, and then we go to our um, perception, our, our association cortex for perception. And now let's move on. And here we have the part of the perception that takes place between the junction of the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe tells us where the thing we're looking at is. And then over here on the left or the right, we look at the what of vision. What are we looking at? Um, now, moving on. Um, oh, and then uh, here's something one of you brought up earlier. I think it was you, Miles. Here we have now the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And the left has to do with linear. I'll blow that up. Here's the left hemisphere linear, sequential, detailed, linguistic. Those are the kinds of processing that the left side will do.
and then the right side of visual perception is it's holistic, it's global, it's spatial, it's pictorial. Make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay. And Elizabeth, you shook your head yes, but the look on your face said that you didn't seem to be certain. Now I've lost no, your I'm voice again. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's okay. No. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. You sure you have it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Even at 6 in the morning, you still have it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. And Miles, that makes sense to you? Different kinds yes. of processing on the two different sides of the brain. All right, moving on. Now we went then to, and I'm just going to go through this quickly because we're going to go back through it again. We're going to go back through this over and over and over again until you all have it, you know, like it's your new best friend. Um, and here we have our hearing. And now we have our ears. The, the sound goes into the thalamus. And now, what does the thalamus do with it then? Oh, it tasks it out. And, and it's going to send it to where? I like the that. primary I like that auditory. Term. I like that term, tasks it out, Miles. That's a good term. I'm going to take that. Um, so it's going to send it. Goes it to the, the superior... Um, temporal lobes, which is the primary auditory cortex. Excellent. Now, uh, give me one more word about the temporal. It's superior, and it's also something else. Oh, anterior. Anterior superior. Okay. And here we are. There's the thalamus deciding it's going to, where it's going to send it to, and here it goes. And you can see it here, anterior, superior, temporal lobe. And what 1020 system placements? T3, T4. T3 and T4. Maybe. Um, no, that, that's oh, primary. Yeah. That's the best we have from a 1020 point of view. And now it goes out there. And what happens when that auditory input goes out to T3 and T4? Um, like, is, like, primary, like, is this a noise or is this language or... Um, just is, right now, it just says that sound's coming through. That's all it knows. Sound's coming through. Sound's coming through. And there we are. And then it sends to the... Go ahead. Association cortex. Yes, the, the auditory, auditory association. Right. And where is that going to be? Kind of below it and um, posterior. Uh, it is going to be posterior, uh, mm -hmm. not not below. What part of the temporal lobe is it going to be? Is it going to do the primary or the uh, association auditory processing? What part of the temporal lobe? Well, isn't it the part between T three C three and P three and T five, sort of in the middle there? Okay, but if you had to give me a part of the temporal lobe, what would it be? Is it the posterior superior? It it, it is done there, but it's also yeah. done in the anterior portion. Go ahead, Miles. What were you going to say? Like P three. But I want an anatomical. You're giving me ten twenty. Oh. I'm interested in 1020, but at first I want an anatomical structure. But anterior is in the front. That's not my temple. It's going to be both anterior and posterior. What I wanted you to say is it is the superior temporal lobe. It's the entire superior temporal lobe. The primary processing is only done in the anterior portion. But for the association, it is the entire, both anterior and all the way back to the posterior, superior temporal lobe. Let me, uh, let me go here to something. See if, yeah, here we go. Here's a good view of it. 
So look at my screen. And here's our temporal lobe. I'm circling it with my pointer. Okay. And it's not up on the screen yet. Oh, it's not. Oh, okay, that's good for you to let me know that, Miguel. I know there's... Okay, the, okay, now it's Got it there. now? Okay. So yeah. here we looked at uh, what we talked about about five, ten minutes ago. Here is the inferior temporal for the visual association. Okay, everybody see that? Um, and then up here is the superior temporal for the auditory association. Everybody good? Did that come up yet, Miguel? Yeah. Okay. Yes, 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 let's see. And, and so now let me, here is the, um, here is the uh, anterior superior, where I'm circling right now. That's where the primary auditory processing takes place. And then the auditory association um, is done all the way up where the primary is and then all the way back here close to uh, parietal three. Make sense? Yeah. I'm oh, good. Um, Okay, now let me let go of that. Let's go back to where we were. Um, so here we have it sent out to the superior temporal lobe on both sides for perception. And here it is, now it's there, and it's transforming the primary auditory into an auditory perception. And now, on the left hemisphere, blow that up, we have the same concepts that we had for visual. We have that it's linear. If someone's speaking, it's letter after letter, word after word. It's sequential, like if we're listening to a song, it's note after note after note. It's detailed. It takes the smaller pieces. We went over all of these when we talked about the left hemisphere functions. Okay? And one of the primary things it does is linguistic. Linguistic is not the only thing it does, but that's certainly one of the primary ones. And clearly one of the primary ones that people are going to come to you for for neurotherapy. A lot of people come because of having problems in school. And school is made up very much of linguistic. Okay? Um, now, on the right side, we have a change. On the left side for both visual and auditory, it stayed pretty much the same. It was linear, it was sequential, it was detailed, it was linguistic, whether you hear the words or you read the words. But on the right, whereas for visual, we had that it was um, uh, spatial and global, and pictorial, but when it comes to the auditory, it now goes to things like intensity, and pitch, and cadence, and amplitude, and duration. So like for singing? Uh, singing, but even just voice. So um, if... if like for Go ahead, Miles. Like for sarcasm, so like understanding sarcasm yes. and yes. tone of voice and all that kind of stuff? Yes, very much. That's a good example. A good example. And it doesn't have to be negative. Um, sarcasm is certainly a good example of the negative thing. But uh, when if, if I'm going through this webinar 
and one of you comes up with an answer that I wasn't expecting you to come up with because um, it's like, wow, you had a really good insight. I could say to you, wow, great job, Elizabeth. Um, and there it would not be um, a sarcasm. There would be excitement and uh, joy and whatever in my voice. And so the, uh, the different ways we say a word or make a sound, that is the, what the right hemisphere picks up on. Okay? And that's happening in the association, in the auditory association? That is the first okay. step of it happening, yes. We can perceive these kinds of qualities. Uh, we, Basically, or primarily? Yes, we, we're not fully comprehending them yet. We're going to go to some more steps for that. But we can perceive that something, uh, there's a motion or it's very flat um, either way, but we can perceive that. Okay, moving on. Now, just going to jump here. Here's the touch. And again, this can be any part of the body. We just use the hand as an example. And now, once we have that, once you touch something, where does the signal go? Thalamus. To the thalamus. Okay. And the thalamus is then going to do what? Send it out to the primary motor, the primary somatis, primary somatosensory cortex. Excellent. Um, and where is the primary somatosensory cortex? In the temp, the parietal lobe behind the motor cortex. Very good. Like a CP, CPZ, CP3, CP4. That is so C3, CZ, C4. Is that is what it you said? CP3? Um, CP3 and C4. Uh, well, okay. So, yeah, we just usually call it C3, CZ, C4. But it is the anterior portion of it. Uh, McGill, you had said something. I missed it. No, I was saying exactly the same thing. Okay. Very good. Okay. So here we go. It goes to the thalamus. The thalamus determines where it's going. And there it is. The anterior parietal lobe. And I'll blow that up. And there's our C3, CZ, C4. But it is the posterior portion of C3, CZ, C4, which is the point you were making, Miles, with talking about the P's in there. Yes. Okay. And then it's going to go there, and what are we going to have happen? You're going to, like, feel how intense the pressure is or, like... At this point, lower orders. yeah. At this point, we're just going to know there's some kind of touch. We don't know much about it. We just know the sensations for touch are coming in. Okay. All right. Now there we are, and now we're moving on um, to the next piece of what we do. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, I didn't get to this. So here we now have it go from the anterior portion of the parietal lobe, and it's moving back toward the central portion. And in the central portion, that's where we have our what taking place. Elizabeth, any idea what's happening there? Um, the association. Excellent. Association. And what's the association going to provide for us? The perception. A perception. Excellent. 
And I said last time, uh, I have not worked out yet, and I haven't seen it written, and it's maybe out there, but I couldn't find it yet, how you differentiate left from right. If someone touches the left side of the body, we know that's going to be processed on the right side of the brain. Um, but I have not been able to find things like, is it linear or is it uh, spatial uh, when it comes to touch? So I will keep looking, and when I do, that will be part of an update that comes at some point. Okay, now moving on, and here we are now going to the next step. Um, and here is our limbic system, and this is the page that I was told is missing from your manual, so uh, that will be out to you. Um, the limbic system has four major parts, and what are those four major parts? Cingulate. Cingulate. The hippocampus. Hippocampus. The amygdala. 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 And now... Septal nucleus. Excellent. Septal nucleus. Good. The septal nucleus is the one that most people don't talk about very much. Um, but, uh, yeah, very important. We can't train it directly. Uh, it's too deep and that doesn't have the pyramidal cells. But uh, it is very uh, critically important to what it is that, uh, that we do as neurotherapists. Okay. Moving along. Now, here are the functions of our limbic system, the different parts of it. Uh, we have, and I'll blow this up again, we have uh, the origin of emotion, the origin of motivation. We have two types of memory, and uh, we're going to change this word informational. It's all informational. We like the word um, factual and then emotional. And then um, we have, uh, in fact, I, something I should have done with you. What part of the brain, what part of the limbic system is going to do factual memory? Hippocampus. Hippocampus. What part is going to do emotional memory? Amygdala. 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 What part's going to do this pleasure and displeasure reward system? Septal nucleus. Excellent. Very good. Um, and now, what has to do with the flexibility? The cingulate. The cingulate. Cingulate. Excellent. Excellent. Good. All of you are jumping in. I like that. Now, now here's a last thing. Uh, from a Freudian perspective, and uh, most of you are going to know that Freud talks about the id and the ego and the superego. Um, what part of that id, ego, and superego does the, the limbic system play? Id. Id, yes. Id. Excellent. I want what I well, want. It could be more than one. Uh, that's like different, I think different uh, different parts in the limbic system could play different parts of his little triangular trifecta or whatever. I, I think that different parts of the limbic system do do different things, clearly. Um, but the if you want to talk about superego, that would not be here. Uh, and I don't think of ego as primarily being part of this in one sense of that word. So it, it is primarily, at least as I see it, the id. The id saying, I want what I want, and I want it now. Um, that's, you know, that's what the id thinks about. And, and we think of that so often in a negative way, but this is what a child, uh, uh, an infant, I just had a, a grandchild born a couple months ago, and all that child knows at that point is, I'm hungry or I'm wet, uh, or I need to be burped, or I'm sleepy. And the, the little girl, her name's Lily, um, she, she doesn't, you know, she cries. 
that's the all the only way she knows how to communicate but she's saying I want something and I want it now um, and those systems are necessary for each of us, no matter how old we are, to survive. Now, as we get older, we have language. We have the ability to go and get food or to go to sleep. Um, so we can delay the gratification. We can talk about it. But the generators are still there from this limbic system just like they are for Lily at a couple months old. Um, okay, now moving on. Now we are going back to our um, parietal and um, we are going to go we are going to look here at C, the matching of the somatosensory uh, and visual perceptions with memory hippocampal. And here we are in the temporal, and we're going to look at the same thing. Here it's D. I'll blow that up. Second. So the matching of the auditory and visual perceptions with memory hippocampal. Here's a picture of our hippocampus. And here's the jobs the hippocampus does. So on the left side, we have listening verbal, long-term, auditory, and visual reading, uh, verbal memory, I should have said, listening verbal memory, and then visual reading memory, um, and long-term. And on the right side, we have the nonverbal, the intonation and cadence and all those things, and the visual uh, spatial memory long term. And now let's go down to some examples. So here we are with our boy and girl in love with each other. And what comes next? Oh, don't sit there. Need everybody to answer me. What happens next? Wait, wait. They see yeah. each other. Where does the information go? Oh, it goes to the hippocampus uh, of the eyes. I mean, it goes to the thalamus. Thalamus, yes. So here we take the visual input, and it's going to go through to the thalamus, and then what's the thalamus going to do? Send it to the occipital. Send it. It's going to sort it out. Yes. And send it. And send it to the occipital. Exactly. And what part... Uh, uh, what what ten twenty placements for the occipital? O one o two o z. O one o two o z. Excellent. And there it is. And then when it gets there, what's going to happen? It's going. There's the the way. Association. Not Please. not oh. association yet. Then, uh, what's the first step? What and where? What and oh, where? That's the second step. What's the first step? It recognizes like, like this is um, like the color and the sh like this is female shape. I'm looking at. Not, this, not uh, yet. No, not simpler yet. than that. Just, just, just like this is moving or this is stationary. Right. And what this word is, do what we? Color what, is it? what word Which, do we use so for the first step? Primary. 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 Okay. There we are. Primary visual processing. And now, what's the next step? Association. It goes to the association. The signal moves up and it moves out slightly. Yes. And when it goes up, it's going toward what part of the brain? What anatomical structure? PC. Like the, um, yes. So no, that's, it's like the, yeah. 
at P3, P4. Okay? And that's the part, the back part of the parietal lobe, the posterior parietal. And then where else does it go? What other anatomical structure? The superior temporal lobe the on the left yeah. and the right side. Not, okay. su not yeah. superior. Inferior. Inferior temporal. Okay. Oh, visual, yeah, yeah. Right, visual inferior temporal. And there we are. And here it's going toward the parietal, this junction between the occipital and the parietal. And then it goes out to the inferior temporal on both sides. And tell me the, the, the process, the visual process that takes place here between the occipital and the parietal. Perception? Yes, but well, the where? The where, exactly. The what? The where. Okay, this is oh, the where. The what and the when happen on either side. Uh, hold on one second. Sarah's giving me a message here. Uh, don't forget to end recording. I have no idea how to do that. I don't know either. Okay. He, he said he has the notes over there in the... Here? Yes. Okay. You were supposed to be following those. <laughs> yeah, right. I know stop recording is pressing that, but then he said there's some process too. But I hit Wait. the stop recording button. I'm guessing that's what you do. And then he said there's some process that comes through. Right so. there. I'm just going to click on that. And then you're saying I should read these notes. It says it needs to run. <laughs> Allow Windows Media File to process for about 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Yesterday it was still on four hours later. Oh my. I don't know. Anyway, okay. that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm back here. So um, we've got the inferior temporal on both sides, and that is the what of vision. Okay. And now what tell me about the type of Processing on the left. What linear. kind of linear, linear, sequential? Logistical. <clears throat> Detail. Logical. Linear, sequential, verbal. Yes. Okay. Very good. And now on the right. It's going to be more Global, holistic. Special, and, uh, okay. Holistic. Excellent. 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 Okay. Moving on, and now, that's where we ended last time, and now we're going to go to our new information, and we have a split. Um, the information, the visual information, is going to go to the hippocampus for factual memory, and it's also going to go to the amygdala for emotional memory. And we can only take one track at a time. So we're just going to look at the hippocampal first. Okay? So here we are, and now we've done our new thing. We ghosted this out. We ghosted out the emotional, which says we're just following the factual, visual, factual memory track first. And... So we have our visual perception, and now it is going to go down to the hippocampus, and what is it going to do down there? Let me actually take you there. It's going to match to, to previous knowledge. Excellent. It's going to see if it matches to previous knowledge. Excellent, excellent, Miguel. Um, it's, we are having a memory match as McGill just said. And uh, look here at our color system. Um, as you get used to this, I think it's very helpful. Down here in our head, you see that we go from red, which is, is what? What's the red mean for us? Going away from? In input. No, the red, input, like, the red means surface. Send it to surface. Mm -hmm. Surface. And then the green means what? Deep. Coming from the bottom up. Deeper structure. The green means deeper structure. And now 
the dotted lines, what do they mean? Well, they must mean the, the movement between them. Okay, it says... Between the, the deeper structures and the, and the surface structure. Right, and here's the surface, and you see how the surface is ghosted? That means information's leaving there. And the dotted lines mean information's coming to it. Make sense? Okay, if it's ghosted, the colors are ghosted here. That means information's leaving. And where the lines are dotted, that means information's coming towards. Um, all right, moving on. And now here we are. Now the full green says the process is taking place. The data from our surface perception is now getting to the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, as McGill said a few minutes ago, there is a memory matching. And on the left, it's memory matching for linear and sequential and detailed and linguistic. The memory matching on the right, I mean, I should have blown that up for you. There we are. And the memory matching on the right, the factual memory matching on the right, is for holistic, global, spatial, and pictorial perception. Okay? And then, that's where we're leaving off right now for visual. And now we're going to move on to auditory. Um, and here for auditory, you can see uh, D under temporal. And we have the matching of the auditory and visual perceptions, which are cortical surface, with memory hippocampal. Moving on. Here we got our girl listening, and we're assuming that this song has some words to it. I know uh, lots of songs today don't have any words to them. Um, or it has a melody to it. Lots of songs today don't have any melody. But for her, for our needs, she's hearing both words uh, as well as music. Now, what's the next thing going to happen? Goes to the thalamus. Goes to the thalamus. Excellent. Okay, so... And then the primary um, auditory processing. Okay, and now, wait, wait, one step first. What's the thalamus going to do, Miles? Send it. It's going to decide where yes, to send it, and it will most likely, because it's music, and it's, wait, if she's, like, at a rave or something, would it just go straight to the limiting system and bypass, like, perception, and she'd just be starting flailing out? I, since since yeah, I don't know exactly what like, a rave is, I can't answer that, Miles. <laughs> Like if it's like really intense, if it's really intense bass, and like she's physically feeling the music as well, you know. Well, if she's physically she's feeling thinking it, about what it that, means. if she's physically feeling it, then I assume that there's a certain amount of somatosensory. That if the bass is so strong, it's making her body vibrate. So that would not be the auditory part, which is all we're looking at right now. Um, but yes, you might be right. Now, so, and now the thalamus decides where it's going to go, and in this case, where does it go for auditory? To the superior. The primary auditory. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Superior. Oh, temp temporal. And the temporal. Give, give me one more word, Miguel. Superior. Anterior. 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 Anterior, superior, temporal. And what happens there? Um, it gets changed into a perception. It gets no, not no perception yet. Processed. It's sent to the to the what? It goes to, from there. It's, um, basic stuff happened to the to the um, 
association, Arthur Association Cortex, which is but slightly you're, below you're, that. You're jumping. I need the first step. When it gets to the surface, what is the first thing that is done? Primary processing. Primary. Primary. Don't skip the primary. So we are going to the anterior superior, as you all said, and now when we get there, and what 1020 system placements? T3, T4. T3, T4. T4, yeah. Okay, and when it gets there, we now have the primary auditory processing, okay? So here we are. Now it's at T3, T4, and it gets processing of the primary auditory input. Now, what's the next step? This was what you were all trying to tell me before. What's the next step after the primary auditory processing? The perception. Goes to the assess auditory association cortex. Auditory association cortex. Which is above the... And McGill said for perception. So it goes to the association cortices for perception. And what anatomical structure does this perceiving? Um, mm. It's the whole superior, inferior, in superior temporal lobe. Yes, Elizabeth is correct. It is the entire superior temporal lobe, both the anterior and the posterior portion of it. And here's the picture, and there you have the, here's the superior temporal lobe on both sides. What happens in the inferior temporal lobe? Visual processing. Visual association. Excellent. Excellent. Visual association area for visual perception. Excellent. Okay, moving on. Now... We get there. I have a Did you say something, Miles? Um, the primary, yes, the primary auditory cortex, that little area, isn't that called, is there a name for it? It's like Wen, Wenrickis? Or uh, Wernickis. Wernickis? Yeah. Like, isn't there a guy who, who discovered that on the left side? Wernicke. Yes. Yeah, Wernicke. There's oh, some that. people will say it as Wernicke. It's a German, and uh, sometimes people use the W, and sometimes people use a V to the way they say the word. Um, but yes, you are exactly right. Now, he is primarily talking about what goes on toward the posterior portion of it. Usually you think of Wernicke's area back around P3, parietal 3. Okay? Um, now, moving on here, so we have our left side, and what do we have for the left side of auditory perception? Linear. linear are you talking about linear sequential detail? That, that stuff. Correct. That's what I'm talking about. Linguistic. And now on the right side, what do we have? Prosody. Pitch. Give me a couple more. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Intensity and cadence and amplitude and duration. Good, good, good. So you got to know these things. Want them all in your head. Um, so when it had visual, we had the holistic and pictorial um, and global with the language, excuse me, with the auditory, not language, but auditory, we now have these other qualities of intensity and pitch and cadence and prosody and all of that. Okay, and now our next step, we are going to go here to this, um, the splitting it goes in two different directions now, and one of them is auditory factual memory. Okay? Um, mm -hmm. 
That's like, do I know this song? Uh, yes. Now, but but uh, stick with me. There's a particular word I want you to use here. Um, and let's go over here. Let's watch right this. Here. And I'll come back to the word. No. There's a, another word I want you to do, or a phrase, actually. That now the information is moving from the surface, and hence our red arrows, the red part of the arrow. I'll blow that up. So the red part of the arrow, it's leaving the surface and going towards the what? Hippocampus. Hippocampus. Okay? And the perception on the surface is now doing what with the hippocampus? McGill, you had said this earlier. Matching. Matching. Matching memory. It's a memory match. And here you see it uh, up here. It's moving. Let's move to the next one. And here it is. The matching of the auditory perception with the auditory factual memory. So we are doing right now an auditory memory match. And we have the, what we just went through, the left side matches for linear kinds of perceptions and sequential and detailed, and the right side matches for our intensity and pitch and cadence and so forth. Okay? So the memory match for auditory is now taking place. Okay, very good, very good. Now, moving along, um, and now we're going to our parietal lobe because we're, we're going to go to um, the somatosensory system. And here we have same concepts, just for these different systems. And now for this, we have the matching of the somatosensory and visual perceptions, which is cortical, with memory hippocampal. And now we've got our lady touching her prized flowers. And what's going to happen next? Memory matching. No, 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 no. We're many steps away from memory matching. What's the first step? She touches the flower. Go to the thalamus. Go to the thalamus. Uh, go to the thalamus. Okay. And then, uh, once it gets to the thalamus, what does the thalamus do? It tasks it out. Okay. It tasks it out. That's right. Miles, new word for me. New phrase. Um, so it's going to decide where it goes. And where does it go? Um, the primary somatosensory cortex. Primary somatosensory. And um, wh what anatomical structure does this primary somatosensory process? The central strip, posterior, or like slightly posterior central strip. Uh, mm -hmm. um, that give me, you're right. That is a way of saying it, the, the uh, somatosensory, or I mean the, the sensory motor cortex, the back part of it. But uh, tell me it from another point of view. Tell me it from a parietal lobe point of view. Oh, the anterior... You have it. Just say it. The anterior parietal. Okay, the anterior that's parietal. On. Ask your question, Miles. That's the um, like right on the, right on the back side of the sulcus. Yes. Okay. So the anterior parietal. We have our sensory motor cortex, the motors on the front end, and the, the somatosensory is on the back end. But from a parietal point of view, it's the anterior portion of the parietal lobe. 
Okay? And now, what 1020 system placements? C3, C4, C4 C3. Z. Excellent. And there we are. I'll blow it up. So here we are, anterior parietal lobe. It projects up to. And um, that's C3, CZ, and C4. All right. And now, for somatosensory, what's the next step in the somatosensory circuit? It goes um, backwards more to the... Um, posterior, yes. Temporal lobe more not, posterior not, to not, the, not uh, the not association not cortex. Yes, but you said temporal, not temporal. Parietal, parietal. Parietal, excellent. Excellent. That's good. And that is for association. And when it goes oh, to the association, what job do we have? Yeah, what job, Elizabeth, does association take care of? The perception. Perception. Excellent. So here is the anterior. Where did my mouse go? Okay, there it is. Here is the anterior parietal lobe is where the primary processing takes place. And then it shifts posteriorly toward the central parietal lobe. And that is where our association takes place. Um, and so now we have the somatosensory. The primary input is turned into a somatosensory perception. Okay? <clears throat> now, um, now our next step, we are going to our hippocampus, and what's going to happen when we get to the hippocampus? Elizabeth, what do you think? Matching. Okay, very good. And so we are going to have at what kind of matching at the hippocampus? Factual. A fact, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, factual memory matching. Okay? Yeah. So the perception is moving down to the hippocampus for... Um, somatosensory factual memory match. And here it is, the matching of the somatosensory perception with somatosensory factual memory in the hippocampus. Okay? So there we are. And move along. Now, we go to a next step. This is our next primary step. Um, and that is the material after the memory match is done down in the hippocampus for visual, for auditory, for somatosensory. Once the memory matching is done, it then comes back up to the surface, and what happens when it comes back up to the surface? Anyone? We haven't gotten to this yet, but I didn't know if anyone knew. It comes back up to the surface for comprehension. Okay, a number of you were talking about comprehension earlier, and I said we have a bunch of steps yet to go uh, before we get there. And so here we are in the central parietal lobe, parietal central, and we are going to have D, the comprehending of the memory match. So the comprehending is cortical of the memory match, which was just happened hippocampus. And let me give you an example there. 
Now we're back to our boy and girl. Um, these are, these are going to become friends of both of yours. You're getting to see them so often. Um, and uh, the first step, let me uh, blow this up just a little more. Um, now, let's go through it. Let's go through it hopefully quickly. What happens next? Come on, come on. Everybody should be jumping in here immediately. What are we doing? We're starting right all over again. Visual. Yeah, Sarah, visual. Oh. Um, then it goes to the thalamus. It goes to the thalamus. Yeah, and copy and paste. And what happens at the thalamus? It gets tasked Just like select them all and then copy. It tasks out. Tasks out. Good, Miguel. Um, and it's going to task it out to where? The primary visual cortex in, uh, in the posterior mm. occipital area. Excellent. And uh, 1020 point of view, where is that? 010Z02. Oh. 010Z02. Very good. No. So there it is. And we have primary visual processing here. And now what's the next step? It gets... Then it goes to the um, anterior... <laughs> Occipital, or no, more superior, where you have the association, and then it um, and then it goes kind of like the sides, where it determines the what, or yeah, the what, and then in the center it's the where. Very good. Now you said after it does the primary processing. Yes. Now you said Miles that it was anterior, or excuse me, posterior occipital. It's posterior parietal. For the parietal. Right. Um, so we have the anterior parietal. Let me circle them for you. Here's the anterior parietal up here. Then we have the central parietal in here. And then the posterior parietal is back here. So for the wear of vision, for visual perception, the wear of vision, that's going to be a combination of the posterior parietal and the anterior occipital, happening right in this area here. Okay? And then, uh, now the one thing that no one said yet is when we go to the what of vision, what neuroanatomical structure does the perceiving for the what? Central. No. Nope. No, inferior. Oh. Inferior what? Inferior temporal. Inferior temporal. temporal, exactly. Inferior temporal. All right. And here we go. And there it is. So you can see that the we did our primary visual processing here in the occipital, and then it moved anteriorly to the posterior part of the parietal, and it also moved laterally to the inferior uh, parts of the temporal lobe. Okay? Now, when you all three of you start dreaming about this, then I'll know I got my job done. Um, okay. <laughs> um, now, moving on. It's going to go there, and when it gets there, uh, what happens? What's the next step when it gets there? No, that's good. I just know that. Say it again, Elizabeth. It goes. It's primary, it's primary, um, oh, it's perception, sorry, and then it'll go um, from matching to the, either the hippocampus or the amygdala. Okay, very good. So it is perception is our next step. And we have our different kinds of perception, left and right, correct? And you see them up there. What are they? The, oh, the left side is uh, linear, linguistic, detailed and uh, uh, 
sequential, and then the right side is the global spatial pictorial and um, like pitch and tone and stuff. No, 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 because this is visual. No pitch and tone for visual. Visual. Okay. Okay. So this is our visual, holistic, pictorial. global, spatial, pictorial. Um, and so, yeah, we got to stick with visual right now. Now, once we get our perception, our visual perception, what's the next step? Where are we going? We're going to the hippocampus or the amygdala? Uh, yeah, but right now only hippocampus. Oh, okay. okay, I mean, it goes to both of them at once, but since we can only look at one track at a time, uh, we're just going to take the hippocampus and what takes place in the hippocampus? Factual memory matching. Visual memory matching. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Uh, there we are. Well, Miles, say that again. I was going to say the same thing. Okay. All right. So it's now leaving the surface. So hence the red here says it's leaving the surface. And the green says that it's moving toward the deeper structure. And the dotted line says it's, it's leaving again the, the surface where the perception just took place. And now it's going down to the hippocampus for our factual memory matching. Okay. And there it is. Matching of the visual perception cortical with the visual factual memory hippocampal. And we have our things that vision does, right? Linear, sequential, detailed linguistic on the left and holistic, global, spatial, pictorial on the right. All right, very good. And now we are doing the next step, which uh, I told you about, well, you haven't seen yet. Where does it go next? So now it goes. Are you talking about a new step? Uh, what, one we haven't seen yet, Miguel. I spoke about it a couple minutes ago, but we haven't seen it yet. What's the next step? A, the, a new step. Miles, any idea? Uh, Miles? Well, once it's been memory matched, then it has to go to... Um, to the part of the brain where it's going to um, decide what it is. So, yes, this is a perception that I've seen and I know about, and now what am I going to do about it? Okay, now, but and when you say do about it, that's two steps from now. The next step, Okay. let me, here we go, it just comes right back up to the surface. It's going to be right on top of where the hippocampus was. The hippocampus was at P3. In fact, uh, let me go back. I didn't make a, a point out of that. Um, here, the hippocampus is underneath the parietal 3 and the temporal 5. It's right underneath the central parietal and this anterior superior temporal. Everybody see that? On the left we have parietal 3 and temporal 5. On the right we have parietal 4 and temporal 6. So the hippocampus is down underneath these two placements. Or four placements, two on each side. And then it comes back up to the surface right over top of those same placements. Okay? Right. That's all right. Um, it comes right back up over those same placements. And now we have what?
Like what? What? What job happens? What function happens when it comes back up to the surface? Nobody. Read my screen here. We have comprehension. All right. We have visual, factual comprehension or understanding. So the memory match took place deeper, and now the comprehension takes place up on the surface. Okay? So when this happens, it's like uh, the, uh, the example I have used for the auditory system. This is the visual system. Uh, but for the auditory system, that the new church, I now can look at the Spanish words. There is, uh, I have a perception of the Spanish words. But then when it comes to the surface, or when it goes down to the hippocampus, I have no memory match because I don't know Spanish. So without a memory match in the hippocampus, I cannot have a comprehension. So does the signal still go to the hippocampus even if you don't know what it's, is it, does it still try and match up even if you don't have anything there to match it to? I would expect that it would, Miles. It's going down and it's looking, but I get there and there's nothing there. If I'm trying to understand Spanish, but I don't know Spanish, then that's going to be a problem. But under most of it, what we're looking at primarily is people coming to you. They have some language problem. Uh, they know English but they go down for a memory match and maybe they just haven't gone far enough in their educational system. Maybe there's new words uh, in English that are coming, but they don't know the words. So it doesn't have to be a different language. Um, and so we have more words and um, if, it, if it goes down and it's words they know, which is what we're looking at here, it comes back to the surface and now we can have comprehension. The memory match just took place, and now because the memory was intact um, for the words, in this case visual, they just read the words on a page, and they come up, and now we have comprehension. Make sense? Yep. Okay, Miles? Miles, have I lost you? Yeah, yes, no, no, that makes sense. I have to turn off my web. I'm sorry, you have to turn off what, Miles? No, because um, my connection is slow. Okay, okay. All right. Um, I have to turn off my webcam because my connection is slow. Right, that's fine, that's fine. Um, now... That's what we have on the left. Over on the right, we have the same issue, only over on the right, maybe we go for a memory match of a face, of an expression on a face. And uh, I see expressions on your faces. I've uh, fed that back to you, that it looked like maybe you weren't understanding, or on the other hand, it looked like, oh, they really got that, that it looks like that made sense to them. So on the left, we can have uh, words, for instance, and on the right, I look at the facial expressions uh, to figure out what is it that all of you are understanding or not understanding. So we've come back up to the surface for our comprehension. All right, everybody's good? Yep. Okay. Now, moving along, now, and Miguel, this is what you... I have a question about the hippocampus and the mig. Go ahead, Miles.
Okay. Um, so when the amygdala is used to process so like emotional memory, to, to um, when, you, when things go from the association cortex and they either go to the um, uh, hippocampus for factual memory or the amygdala for emotional memory, how is it distinguished whether they should go to, is it send the same signal to the hippocampus and the same so signal to the amygdala and they just process them differently? That is my is it, uh, that is my best sense, Miles. Uh, that's not something I've gotten into because it doesn't affect my training. Um, but that's my best sense that the same signal goes to both, and then they each do their job. Uh, the one the hippocampus processes the factual part of the memory that just came in. I mean, of the perception that just came in and the amygdala processes um, the emotional component of the perception that just came in. Uh, that's something I, I can't say authoritatively. I don't know if somehow the thalamus has one part of it that sends for factual and one part that sends for emotional. I've never heard that, but I don't know that for sure. Okay? But it's not really relevant for a clinical perspective. And that's exactly right. It's not really relevant for a clinical perspective. Um, and that's what I usually stick with, what is most relevant for clinical. Okay, moving on. Now, McGill, you had said earlier um, there, the, you went to the next step. And what is the next step after we have comprehension? A decision about what to do with the comprehension. Excellent, excellent. And here we are. And now look on the screen. And there it is. This comprehension is now sent to the prefrontal cortex. And we're not ready to get into that yet, but that's where the decision making is going to take place. So we just went through the whole system visually to get us up to the prefrontal cortex. All of these steps have to be done. And of course, you have this glorious machine. From my point of view, God's highest order of creation is the human brain. The sun is vastly bigger, but it's really only a simple machine. Um, there are many other things that are, are big or powerful, but they're simple. Um, but I think that, again, the highest level of creation is the, the human brain. Um, and the prefrontal is, uh, we're going to get to that. Um, uh, I don't know if we'll get there today yet, but uh, we'll get there for sure by our third time together next week. All right. Now, we just did the whole visual, the whole first half of the visual. Any questions on the first half of the visual? And now we're going to go to auditory in a second here. Okay, Elizabeth shaking her head no, that she has no questions. How about you, Miguel? No, I'm fine. And Miles? No questions. Very good. Okay. Now, before we go to visual, excuse me, to uh, auditory, let me show you something. Uh, about the comprehension, the visual comprehension. So, what do we have here? What does it look like? What are, I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Do you see all well, these? It's, it's a whole a whole lot of hands and, and various whatever it is that's made up so that the brain will recognize it. It's a face. Yes, it's a face. Okay? If you use your right brain, it's a face. Uh, if you use your left brain, it's a bunch of fingers and hands. Exact. Very well stated, Miles. Very well stated. So the left side of your brain will break it down into its visual components. We know it's a bunch of hands. Um, but the right side of your brain, the visual uh, parts of your brain, will see it as a face. And so this comes 
uh, back in that uh, hippocampus, the right hippocampus, uh, which is underneath what 1020 system placements? T3, the uh, temporals. T4. T4. Oh, the right hippocampus. Correct. So P4, Elizabeth is saying, and what else? T6. And T6. Okay, the odd numbers are on the left, the even numbers are on the right. So parietal 4 and temporal 6, the hippocampus is underneath there. Um, it's really underneath more than there, but those are the two primary placements, I think, of being able to get to it. And that portion in that hippocampus on the right, parietal 4, temporal 6, what lives there? What's one of the many things that live in that right hippocampus? What do you mean? I know that's not a very good question. Um, over on the left side, I said that something lives in the hippocampus on the left for language. Linear, oh, what like linear linguistic. Oh, I want a book. What book have we all known since we were children? The Bible. Well, that's a great book. Uh, a dictionary. A, a dictionary. A dictionary lives in that left hippocampus. Now, oh, in an encyclopedia, a picture encyclopedia lives in the right hippocampus. That's good, Miles. That's very good. Uh, I wanted something else. I want a game. What lives in the right one that matches our dictionary on the left? Monopoly. Ah, it's so like Monopoly. A Pictionary. The Picture, game. yeah. Yes, the game. Pictionary. So over on the right, pictorial. We've talked about pictorial being on the right. And so that is the faces live over on that right hippocampus. We have our dictionary lives in the left hippocampus, and we have this whole group of faces that live in the right hippocampus. And there is a face generator and a face decoder over there. So that is why our brains can look at all these hands, which have nothing to do with a face, but by the way that they're set up, it can make it look like a face, and our right hippocampus will see that. Okay? Now, moving on. Here's something that maybe a number of you have seen. If you take the letters of a word, and you have the same number of letters, and you have um, the first letter being the right letter and the last letter being the right letter, you can mix all the other letters up. And mm. it you can still read it. And what I think this does, the way this works, um, so, uh, can you all recognize this? I uh, could yeah. not believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. So, you, your brain lets you do that. And the way I see this is when you first start to read, the left hemisphere has to see every letter in the right order. And that's how you learn what these letters mean, what they sound like, and how they can create a word. But good readers, again, this is my thought. You think it through for yourself. Good readers um, are able to look at a word as a unit. My, I sadly only read at about 200 words a minute. My wife reads at about 2,000 words a minute. 
And I believe that good readers, they can take and look at the word and it becomes a picture for them. And when it does, you can read that word vastly faster. Um, so people who are very good at any skill eventually shift to the right side of their brain. The left side, you learn the basic units, the discrete basic units. Um, LeBron James. Um, LeBron, if he, do you know LeBron uh, McGill? No. Okay, I didn't think you would. Uh, Take like Michael Jordan. That's, yeah, well, I, she may not know Michael Jordan either, so, because she's not all uh, over in South Africa. So LeBron James is this great basketball player, Miguel. For, sorry, is he this what? Uh, this great basketball player. Oh, okay, 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 I heard you now. And so for LeBron to learn how to play basketball, he has to think about dribbling the ball. He hits the ball, it bounces off of the floor, it comes back, he hits it again, and he has to think about that over and over and over. He has to think about grabbing the ball and shooting it. How does he hold the ball? Is he shooting it to the left, to the right? Should he put more of an arch on it? Um, so he must think about all these details. But if he is ever to become great, he must learn those details, those specific pieces, and then he cannot think about them when he is playing in a big game. He doesn't think about dribbling. He doesn't think about shooting. He doesn't think about how to hold the ball. He just goes and does it. And he watches the, the stop clock. He watches how many minutes are left in the game. He has to know where everyone on the court is. Um, so he must know all those things at once. And the left hemisphere cannot do that. The right hemisphere can. The right hemisphere sees the whole thing at one time. Um, so that is a right hemisphere function. Again, and these words are part of that. Even though they're not in the right order, the letters are not, um, the right hemisphere can still make out what that word is. All right. Have you, have a, before we move on, um, have you ever had a, a person, a, a client who reads the um, who mistake okay you know how you're you see the first and the last letter and then you fill in the word have you heard a person who mistakenly reads words that aren't there because the first and the last letter are the same like if it said um, um, say amazing and they thought it said America or, or you know like like you, you're seeing a picture of a word that not you're not getting the correct picture because you're just glancing at it and you're getting like Miss the sure. picture. Yes, yes. Is that is that a, a, a right frontal hypercoherence? Um, like what, between the front and the uh, back. My position, Miles, and and we'll do uh, another webinar on this. But let me just give you a quick answer. That it doesn't usually. I, I, there may be exceptions to this, but usually it doesn't matter if it's coherence or if it's microvoltage, if it's delta microvoltage or delta coherence or um, beta microvoltage or beta coherence, the issue becomes what part of the brain is involved in that kind of processing. And then you go and look at your brain map or you look at your live Z scores or however it is you make your decisions about where you're going to train, um, and then you determine what is the abnormal metric. Is it microvoltage? Is it coherence? Is it in one frequency or is it in another frequency? Does it show up with eyes open or does it show up with eyes closed or does it show up with both of them? 
is there too much of a certain frequency or is there too little? So that's what I do when I do my brain map review. I go through all of those things, but what I'm basically looking for is that it is some measurement that is abnormal. So when you ask me, is it coherence or not, I couldn't tell you how to break them. Okay. Okay? All right. Uh -huh. uh, so good question. Good question. Now, moving on. And now we are going, um, and Miles, you have to move your thing away. There you go. Um, now we are going to the um, auditory portion of this. We just went through the entire visual system. Now we're going to go through the auditory system. And our new piece here is that parietal central, and we are going to go to that for comprehending, um, going for our memory match, and then for our comprehending. So moving on, same thing for the temporal lobe. Uh, so as we just looked at, part of this comprehension takes place in the parietal lobe at parietal 3 or parietal 4, and part of the comprehension takes place in the temporal lobe, temporal 5 or temporal 6. Here we are, and now what happens next? Thalamus. Thalamus. Good. Go to the thalamus, and what's the thalamus going to do? Um, send it to the primary auditory cortex. Sends it to the primary auditory cortex, and where is that? Uh, where that's going to be like a T3, T4. T3, T4. So superior, temp, superior temporal uh, lobe, right there. You're missing one part of that superior. anterior 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 superior temporal and uh, placements did you say the placement t3 and t4 t3 t4 okay and there we are very good and now once it gets the t3 and t4 what job takes place it recognizes it and then sends it to the auditory association areas which are that, that's why I don't, yeah, that. don't, don't get me to that association yet. It recognizes that. What do we call that? Um, primary processing. Primary Memory processing. matching. No, no, not yet, Miguel. That's five steps away. Um, so we've got here, <laughs> yeah, Miguel's hot to move on. Um, here we have primary processing. primary processing. And now what's the next step after primary processing? Creates a perception you know, in the auditory association cortex, which Excellent. is larger and stretches back and below. Uh, yes, and give me the name anatomically of what part of the brain does this association processing. The superior um, temporal lobe. Superior temporal lobe. Excellent. Um, and there we are, the superior temporal lobe. And it does the, uh, takes the primary auditory, and there we are, turns it into an auditory perception. And now the left hemisphere, what do we have? Linear sequential. Linear sequential. Detailed linguistic. Detailed linguistic. And now for the right what kind of, for auditory processing, auditory perception, what's done on the right? Um, intonation. Yes. Some more? Give me some more. Prosody. Prosody. Um. Uh, amplitude. Amplitude. Pitch. 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 Like musical kind of stuff. Right. Mm. And doesn't have to be music necessarily, although lots of this is has to do with music. But the voice does all of this. Um, if I say, great job, well, you can hear that my intensity just went way up. Uh, I put a pitch to it. My amplitude increased. Um, and even my duration. 
was high was longer. But we don't recognize what that actually means until we compare that. That's right. We know there there is the perception of it. We know that something just happened from a perceptual point of view. Um, that we we don't comprehend it yet what it meant, but we do perceive. So, for instance, if we come back to the language issue, and let's go to the left hemisphere. Um, if you, and I've used this example before, if uh, you don't know English, you know Chinese, uh, I can speak and you could perceive some of my words. I talked about the Spanish church that has joined with us. I can perceive those words. Did, did my question come through before I broke up? Yes. Okay. I was answering it. I was saying that I can perceive things over on the left or the right uh, before I comprehend them. Okay. Okay? All right. Moving on. Now, where do we go next? Wait, wait. Don't you perceive it like... You're talking about like very small amount of time in between perception and comprehension, though. Like, oh yeah, I mean, like, all of this is going to happen. So I am saying words to you, and I say a whole bunch of words to you, and your brain is going through all of these processes so fast. You don't sense that it's step by step by step. Uh, it's like it's just there. Um, so, yeah, it's like, you know, it seems like it's instantaneous. Uh, it's not. It does take a little bit of time. But, yes, there's, it's just bang, 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 bang. It's all done. Okay? Now. I'm going to try and be quiet now. Oh, no, I like you asking questions, Miles. I want you, I like the fact that you're, you know, you want to grab hold of all of this. Um we have 10 minutes left to finish this up, and uh, this is where I wanted to get to. Um, now, what's the next step after perception for auditory? Miguel, you were so, saying this earlier. What's the next step after perception? A memory matching. Memory matching. And where are we going to go for memory matching? To the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus. Actually. I mean the hip. I mean the yes, hippocampus. I, I said to myself that didn't sound quite right, but uh, so you're right. The hippocampus. So we go down to the hippocampus for memory matching. In this case, auditory memory matching. And where, from a 1020 point of view, where is the hippocampus? Elizabeth. Uh, yeah. T4, T6. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And so here we go. Here we're splitting uh, our, just so that we can talk about this. We're going to the factual, auditory factual memory first. And then later on, next time when we get together, we'll go to auditory emotion. But here's factual. And it's going to the hippocampus. And as Elizabeth just said, underneath P3 and T5 on the left and P4 and T6 on the right. And McGill just said we're going there for memory matching. So we are matching the perception, the auditory perception, with auditory memory. Um, and we have our same concepts, linear, sequential, detailed, linguistic on the left. <coughs> And over on the right, we have our intensity and pitch and cadence and amplitude. Um, so we had the perception of all this. And now we're going down to see, is there a memory match that goes along with it? And then, if there is a memory match, now where do we go next? Memory 
Where do we go next? It goes to the area of the cortex that comprehends. Prefrontal. Not prefrontal yet. Go ahead, Elizabeth. It goes to the area of the cortex where we comprehend. And, yeah. and where so is that from a 1020 point of view? It's T5, P, yeah, T5, P3, P4, T6. Yes, it comes. And what's, what is right underneath? the area where we comprehend? The hippocampus. The hippocampus. We just said it, right? Yeah, I want to get that in your heads that here we have the hippocampus is right underneath. It comes right up for comprehension. One is deeper structure, green. The other one is going to be red for being up in the cortex. And there it is. It's coming up. It was down in the green. You can see this. Whoops. It was down in the green area. Now that's getting ghosted out, and it's coming from the green up to the surface where it red. And once it gets there, we've got our comprehension. The memory match worked, and now it comes back up for comprehension. The words I'm saying to you, you are understanding. You have a memory match for them. Um, you heard me say it. It went down. The memory match was there because the hippocampus contained those words. And now it comes back up to the cortex. And now there's a full comprehension of what I was just talking about. Okay. And now the last step in this whole thing. Well, or I, it's not really the last step. I think of this as the last step in one way. We now go to the next step, and what's the next step? Where does the comprehension go? The prefrontal to make a decision. Excellent. Excellent. Prefrontal cortex, and we're going up there to make a decision. And there it is. You can see it moving. We're leaving the back of the head and it's moving up to that prefrontal cortex. Uh, and uh, again, next time we will get into the whole issue of decision making and many other processes that the prefrontal part of the brain does. Um, now we've got five minutes yet. Let's move on through and here we are, we're touching our flower, and where do we go next? Primary somatosensory cortex. Now we got to step first, something before that. Oh, hypothalamus. No. I mean thalamus. Thalamus. Th thalamus. No, no. Yeah, thalamus. Here we are, thalamus. Primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, and so from the thalamus, then the thalamus makes its decision of where to send it. Miles just said the primary um, somatosensory, cortex. somatosensory cortex, which is located where? Anterior parietal. Anterior parietal. Excellent. C, yeah. Mid C3, C4, CZ. Yes. Okay. There it is. Anterior parietal. C3, CZ, C4. And now, when it gets to the anterior parietal, what's the name of the job it does there? Primary, Primary processing. Primary processing. So there we are. Primary somatosensory processing. All right. And now, where's it going next? A little bit back to the prime to the somatosensory association cortex. Yes, which is where. Directly behind it. Yeah, but um, and to slightly posterior. Ah, uh, yeah, but parietal. better name. Everything you're saying, Zach. The hippocampus. No, not yet. No, we're still on the surface. We have the central parietal. This was central parietal. This is the anterior yes. parietal, and now we're going back to central parietal. Okay. Um. And it's really on, it's right between the anterior and the central. Um, 
and now we have what happens when we get the, to that central parietal. Then you understand that you're receiving physical sensation. You understood that, that you were receiving that up in the anterior parietal. But you, you, you have a perception about more, yes. more of the details of it. Yes, now you have a perception. Okay? Like you're yeah, getting a massage or you're getting like hit with a rock or something. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that was graphic, Miles. <laughs> Here I was feeling all relaxed for a moment with that massage, and <laughs> I got hit in the head with a rock. Um, so, yes. Um, we have that happen, and now where are we going next? We have our perception. We're going. Our somatosensory perception goes where? For what? To the hippocampus for memory matching yeah. or to the yeah. amygdala for Excellent. emotional. Excellent. So here we go, and we're just going to take the hippocampal string right now, and... So there it goes from our central parietal lobe on the surface, and it's going now deeper to this uh, hippocampus, a deeper structure. Um, and when we get there, what are we going to do? You already said it. We got somatosensory perception is being matched with somatosensory factual memory in the hippocampus. Excellent. And now, where's it going to go next? Back up to the surface. Back up to the surface, exactly, Miguel. And what are we going to have when we get back up to the surface? Comprehension. Little Comprehension. Little Comprehension. Okay. So we get now our somatosensory factual, memory match, and now it comes up into a somatosensory factual comprehension. So now we're aware that it was a rock that we just got hit in the head with, or we're fully aware that it's a nice massage. Um, and then once we have that comprehension, where does it go? Where you to make the decision. prefrontal. Prefront yeah, for decision making. For the decision making. And so if we're up there, um, and eventually you can see what I've written here, and you have it on your pages, the somatosensory factual comprehension merges with the somatosensory emotional comprehension. So we haven't gone through the emotional step yet, the path yet. But eventually they, they come up here and we have both the facts of it and the emotions of it. Is that true for not just the metasensory but all senses? Yes, for all of them. Well, the three that I'm talking about. Yeah. So visual, auditory, somatosensory, they're all going to come up here and we're going to put the facts and the emotions together. And we'll go so if, a bunch of steps you, after that again. Um, if you were more of a uh, like a lot like if you were more like a Spock kind of a person as opposed to like Captain Kirk kind of a person, if you know what that means, um, I know exactly what, what that means. I'm I'm, the, I'm that surprised that you know what it means, but I I know what it means because I that mean that your 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 prefrontal um was like kind of skewed to one way where it overplays the factual or over overplays the emotional comprehension or kind of like. You know what I'm saying? I do know exactly what you're saying, and that's that is correct. That uh, and we will see this in much more detail when we do our next uh, time together. Um, that we'll see more what the left side of the brain does as opposed to the right side. But you already know that uh, in that we talked about left hemisphere is more logical, so hence Spock, and right hemisphere is more emotional. And if you really wanted to have the right person for emotional, you needed Dr. McCoy. Um, that uh, he was uh, more of that than Captain Kirk was. Captain Kirk was kind of a nice combination of the two. McCoy was more emotional, Spock more factual or illogical. That's a good, that's a good Captain question. Captain Kirk about, gets yeah. angry and makes stupid decisions. Uh, well, he does, but McCoy gets angry and makes more stupid decisions. Uh, 
So um, anyway, go ahead, Elizabeth. But yeah, that's a good question that Miles has got. Which uh, at which stage in that whole pathway is there that preferential um, functioning of one side versus the other? Is it is it in the prefrontal cortex that somebody like Spock would be more left brain? Uh, I believe that um, you, you will understand that answer better when we get well, maybe, to our maybe next it time. Would be, yeah, maybe it would be that if you did the cue and you had a look and somebody like Spock, their right, their right um, side functionality would be impaired or not as good? Uh, not as good from an emotional point of view. There are many things the right side does. Emotion is one of them. And so, yes, how, how he would be How would it come up on a cue? How would it come up on a cue? Well, yeah. and that, that's part of, of um, the whole issue in deciding where to train because uh, people, people say things like, well, if someone comes, uh, so, uh, if Spock came to see me, then he would probably have some abnormal readings because he suppresses the emotion so much by choice. And people say to me, well, Tom, but if Spock likes being that way, if that's what he wants to do, then you might train away what he sees as a good thing. And that's been a, an issue in the field now for many years. And I have a very simple answer to that, and the answer is I don't need to worry about training that away in Spock because Spock's never going to come to see me. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but you might have somebody I guess, I guess, else. Okay, that's the thing. The, the, what you're doing is you're training what the person's coming and complaining about. So that is one exactly thing. right. So Spock yeah. is not complaining, yeah. hence the yeah. Spocks of this world are not yeah. going to come and see me. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, what if that well, if there's a person who has a, a personality like that, but they have symptoms that match that region, you know, that match the, uh, like, like, say, if you have a problem, um, uh, like, like the thing um, I was talking about earlier with you read the words and you misread them, you just read the front and the back letter, and you just immediately snap to a word that's not the word that actually is. Right. And then you have um, a, 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 a abnormal EEG or, you know, going up, like you have big Z-squared or something or some, some you can see there's a, a supposedly a problem with, you know, the right prefrontal or the right frontal area. And then that yeah. person is also a very analytical and emotionally quiet person who, who um, like borderline cold-blooded, you could say. Right. And then uh, how do you treat that? You, you know what I mean? Like, well, what I would do... I mean, uh, here, let me give you an uh, example, and then we're, we're, we must stop. We're a few minutes over. Um, but I like the energy. I like you guys being excited and asking questions. Um, I had a man come to me, a psychologist, for a brain map. And um, there is a connection between the peak of alpha and intelligence. If you have a faster alpha peak, typically your brain is going to process information faster. So, um, uh, but it is also associated with anxiety. If your brain is running faster all the time, you are typically going to be more anxious. Isn't that ratio of high to low? Uh, well, you, that, that's fine. You could, but that's still going to typically create a, a faster peak. Um, okay. And so this man comes, and I've seen peaks of alpha at 10 point. Uh, for an adult, a peak should be a 10. I've seen 10, 5, and 11, even 11 and a half, and 12. Um, this guy comes, and he has a peak of 14 hertz. I've never you seen. Tell that that, you can tell that that's not beta by the morphology. Yes, that is exactly right, Elizabeth. That's exactly right. You look at the morphology of the alpha, you see your nice sinusoidal rhythms, and you count them. And you could count 14 of those nice sinusoidal rhythms back in the occipital and parietal lobe. Um, and that's what he had. So he comes into me, and he's like 40 years old at this time. 
And I said to him, when I was going over this, you must be a very, very smart person. And he said, it's true, I am. But at this point in my life, I'm ready to trade a few IQ points for the ability to be able to relax. So there you have what, what went on in his life. He was coming in part because he had a terrible time relaxing. And for the first 40 years of his life, this served him very well, having this, this fast peak frequency, because he was going to all kinds of school. He had his PhD in psychology, and then he had to set up a practice, and then he, whatever else he did. So the fast peak alpha with the very high functioning brain did him well. But at this point in his life, he set those things up. He's gotten his degree. He's now raising a family. And he wants to be able to relax more and enjoy his kids and um, do some other things. So at one point, the fast peak, he's not going to come for it because it's serving his purposes. But at another point in life, it wasn't serving him. Another aspect of that wasn't working so well for him. So Sorry, Miles... Have you fully trained him and, and has his peak alpha dropped and what's his, his IQ? Is he feeling dumb or is he feeling the <laughs> I can't answer that because he was sent to me by another psychologist who didn't do brain maps and wanted me to do the map. Uh, but it's my position, Elizabeth, that it doesn't make you dumb, that what you can do typically is you can now shift into slower peak when it's time to relax, and you can shift back into that faster peak when it's time to do work. And do you need to do differential training to create that, or just any training will allow the brain to fix um, That's a more complicated question. So uh, I'll get Gary to get to you guys when it comes that I'm going to do a workshop on, or a webinar on that. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's, that, that's a longer answer. I must go. So good to be with you all. I love um, all your energy. What, Miles? Um, I have a very, very brief question. Um, okay, okay, I am really, really under the weather, and I was wondering if I could get a copy of this, the recording, before our next time, so I can review it. Also, I, do you know which three or which pages I should read in the, um, the book that are kind of specifically geared to this? Because I'm assuming you know like what page numbers might line up with what we're talking about more today. Um, I, well, there are no page numbers in the book, in the manual. Oh, yeah. So, but the sections you want to go to, uh, number one, you already have the pathways part, and you will see where we are going next. Uh, certainly, we're going to go to the amygdala uh, to go through that path. And then we are going to go to the frontal lobe to look at all the jobs the frontal lobe does. And then we are going to go through the frontal lobe down to the basal ganglia, which will then bring us back up to the motor strip for behavior. So you can see all of that in your pathways portion. And then you can go to the, uh, the um neurophysiology, uh, which will go through the functions of all of those different parts. Okay. And right. um, can I trade you Can I trade you back some of the points that I earned answering questions, if you'll answer a question for me, even though we're over time? <laughs> go ahead, Miles. I'm going to give you two. Okay. Okay. So I... Um, I'm sick, I have a fever, my head's pounding, like I don't really understand very what's going on. I have no motivation. I feel like I should eat really terrible food that I know is not good for me, and I'm just restless. And then I do um, like a little bit of alpha coherence training in, from A to 12 in between, um, you know like there's a uh, parallelogram in between T3, C3, T5, and P3? Okay. Like, or like almost a square, but okay. Uh -huh. Kind of in the middle of there, more towards the borderline of... Um, just right in the middle there, actually. I put an electrode, and I do that on both sides, and I do alpha coherence training with the link ear reference. And then when I get up and walk away from that, I feel almost like I don't have a, a fever or a flu or anything. I feel like 90% like back to normal, and I have a really good mood, and everything is kind of like bright and happy. What is that about? Like, how does that actually, like my, my sinus pressure is gone. 
all that kind of stuff. And then um, how'd you figure that out? You know, I thought you, you I didn't just really, did you didn't really try to say to me, Miles, that that this was a very simple, easy question. It's going to only take two minutes to answer, did you? You you didn't really try to set me up for that, did you? Um, let me just no, I just you, let oh, me I need to know. A very simple piece of that, and the answer is much longer. Uh, but okay. if you're doing alpha training in general, uh, back in the parietal lobe, uh, it's going to uh -huh. make your whole being be more calm. And okay. if, if and, and calming, uh, your body's feeling stressed, it's feeling conflicted. Um, and so to get into a calming state for healing, and it's good to make us uh, feel uh, more euphoric. Um, the coherence aspect of it, the only way I could answer about the coherence doing that for you doesn't have to do with a general answer. It has more to do with if you have too much coherence or too little coherence, um, then uh, then for you to normalize the coherence is always going to be good. Okay. And does it have anything to do with the killer T cells and like that has to do with your immune system function and, and alpha um, asymmetries on either side or something like that? Well, certainly, uh, again, if your whole brain is in a quieter place, it's going to uh, help you feel better. Um, and as to the killer T cells, um, I can't answer that right now. Have I you must, heard that research, though? I, no, I don't know about that research. Okay, uh, at least I to. don't know it enough that I can can answer it uh, to the degree that I would want to answer it. I have heard the research, but yeah. I'm sorry, I, Miles. What what site were you doing? I, I got to go, people. I got another cl client waiting. So if you guys okay, talk to each other, please do. I like it that you want to interact. Bye bye. All right, and the recording. Uh, I would call, uh, email Gary about that. That's something he takes. All right, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Bye bye, okay. everybody. Okay, bye. 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 Hey, bye. 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 Um, yes. Sorry, what site was it that you were trying?